I won't take very long presenting our guests today because they will present their own work. Um, today we will have two um, short lectures from two young, very prominent uh, ateliers. Uh, one from Mexico, one from Portugal. Uh, two hard contexts, I would say, for, for young uh, offices and uh, for um, uh, our generation, but um, that shows that show that um, there's a lot of variety in what uh, the architects can do in our context, um, and how can we explore the our field? I won't say anything else. We have today um, from Lanza. Um, Isabel and from Corpozelier, uh, Philippe. Uh, I don't know who will start first, but I'll let you start. And thank you very much for joining. And thank you, Isabel, for waking up so early uh, to join us too. And thank you, Philippe, for joining us in a, in a holiday in Portugal too. <laughs> Será que eu começo? Sim, sim. Ok. I'm going to start <laughs> just before I um, fall asleep again. <laughs> no, I'm very happy to be here today, despite the time. Um, because we, I mean, it's not the first time that I collaborated with one of Fala's uh, courses. And I'm afterwards always curious and excited of the outcome. So I hope what, what we're showing today can uh, be of some use for the students. And after the, the short talk, we're always available uh, through media if you guys have more questions. I'm gonna start sharing screen. One moment. Okay, that's it. There you go. So I'm part of uh, Lance Atelier, um, a studio founded in 2015 um, by my partner, Alessandra Arienzo, and myself. Um, we were mainly based in Mexico City. And Anna was commenting on, on, on how hard the context can be for young architects. Um, at the same time, Mexico, it's, uh, it's a very tumultuous context and also a place for opportunities because many things need to be done. And the informality is so um, high that there's some space for freedom. Um, the projects that we're showing today are uh, three projects on public space. And actually two of them are in, in Spain uh, and all of them are ephemeral. And what uh, ephemerality has given to us uh, is the chance to, again, to be very radical, very extreme because um, usually clients for private um, projects are so worried about what you're gonna do because it's gonna last. And we've encountered um, working with public clients, this opportunity for being um, a bit more uh, crazy uh, because they, people weren't so concerned about the, the, outcome, the outcome. So what, what we try to do is bring this uh, same spirit of radicality to our permanent. I mean, of course we know that architecture is never permanent, so so-called permanent um, work. But anyways, because I know the course you're working in uh, has to do with interventions on existing um, architecture and on existing um, complex and heterogeneous concepts, uh, context, um, we thought uh, it would be interesting to talk about these three projects. I'll try to be very fast. To, to give time to Felipe. Um, so this is um, an intervention in, um, in a city in the north of Spain 
con Logroño, maybe not because of Rioja wine. Um, and when we got invited by this uh, festival called Concentrico to do something in Logroño, they told us we could pick up any place in the city, which was a huge challenge because for architects, I mean, the, 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 more, the more constraints you are given, the, the better you are. So we had this uh, huge freedom of picking up any place. And we finally were honest to ourselves that we really wanted to, to work um, in the city. It's a 11th century uh, city. So uh, I guess you're, you're gonna deal with uh, context in, in Swiss that are as old or, or similarly old. And we wanted to be sincere that uh, our dream was to work on, on this square, which is the town hall square. Um, and which is a project that was designed by Rafael Moneo, which is a, an important architect in, in Spain and maybe, maybe even known uh, for you guys. Um, um, because of being in Mexico where uh, the earth uh, shakes, where we have many earthquakes, these really thin and slim columns were like a, a dream to us. And we always had this photo hanging on our wall. So we very shyly asked the, the festival if we could maybe work here. And they were like, yes. And it was very exciting. So what was um, interesting for us was the, the context in which this project had been designed in the, in the beginning. Because in 1973, when Moneo and his team delivered this project, there is the, a fascist dictatorship in Spain that has been on since 39, so for uh, decades. And I mean, the, the, the end of the dictatorship is near, but even more because of that, the, the context is really, um, really, again, really tumultuous, really shaky. So in the same month that Moneo um, submits this project, uh, the president of the Spanish go government is killed in, um, on a terrorist attack. And the car in which he, he's driving through Madrid flies over a, a huge 30 meters building, which is a very striking image. And what is in, important for us is that at this same time, that this thing, these things are happening, Monet and his team are, are submitting a project that is completely for publicness. And actually they talk about the idea of, 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 of publicness as a collective um, thing, as a collective construction. So this is just the, the booklet that the um, the School of Architects in Madrid um, published on, on this project once it was made several years later. So we thought about working with this huge square, which is a hundred meters, it's a triangle, um, hundred meters side on the long side. And we wanted to address this very big scale, sometimes too big and actually too big today, and um, draw um, a sm smaller spaces that could be more uh, appealing, like more of a human scale. So we thought of being able to embrace the three facades, considering that the, 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 the lovely thin columns we love, the, the thicker, bulkier columns we also love, and, and the three facade. And we finally came out with, um, with um, a material that we thought made sense which is the, um, I'm going a bit slower on this first project, but I'm, I'm going to be, be faster on the other two. Um, we thought of working with brick. Um, you're going to see throughout our work that we many times decide to work with just one material. And it sometimes gives protagonism to the material, but at the same time, it becomes very abstract. So it's like the material disappears and you only have the, the graphicness of, of architecture. So here we wanted to work with, um, with brick and um, we always work with uh, models, uh, even if, if we usually remain on a, 
on a not so big scale, but even if, if we're working on the bigger, bigger urban scale, we always work with models and uh, we think um, they're very important for thinking. And actually we, we didn't manage to, to decide on the, on the final layout until, until we did it and, and, and saw how it would um, behave. So even if you're feeling lazy about doing models, uh, we always recommend it. So here you have the, the two main facades and how they dialogue with each other and with these uh, brick circles, which are the high of, of a bench, so 44 centimeters high. And actually this has to do with Monio's um, there's an interview with Monio in which he visits the town hall after, I don't know, 20 years. And he sees some old people sitting on a very, there's there are little five, um, five benches under one of the porticos, uh, sunbathing here, like catching some sun uh, in the afternoon. And he's like, this is my favorite part of the plaza, like these old people uh, catching some sun. So we thought, why not doing huge benches, like really long, uh, welcoming benches in which many people could sit. And well, here you can see the really strong geometry of the, of the town hall and, and how somehow the, the strong geometry of the circles is just trying to respond or dialogue mm, with that. Also something <clears throat> which is important is that today people uh, only walk through here under the porticos because of or the rain, sun, and because it's like the, the, the paths that are already um, like on the, on the collective memory. And with these three circles, we wanted to squeeze the passages through here. We finally had to leave like one meter 20, but we wanted to really squeeze these passages so that people were forced to the center of the plaza, not in a mean, uh, naughty way, but uh, to make to force people to encounter and to force people to, to, to actually inhabit the, the plaza uh, in, a, in a more dense way. So this is how we first thought that the bricks were, gonna to be, were going to be stacked. And this is the piece that were donated that, that we knew that could be donated to us, which is the, what we call ladrillo tosco. Um, and it's the, the material with which um, Spanish social housing has been built uh, since the 80s. So we thought it was nice to, to actually use the same material. This is how we finally start uh, stocking the bricks because it was um, a bit faster. We needed a bit less bricks and because we, we thought that the little gaps in between them uh, had a, a beauty pattern. And finally, the fourth uh, line is complete. So we stuck all the bricks. We did the, the drawing the first day, and then we took two days to stop these almost 20,000 20, bricks. We think we finally used around 17,000, 17, actually. There were uh, around 10 volunteers helping us, other architects from other teams um, from, from the city. It was very meditative, like doing models. We were stocking bricks all day. And after we had finished, my partner spent like another eight hours with that hammer, like trying to, to make the circles really look like circles, while everybody thought it, they looked like circles already. So, um, I mean, we, we all had fun. Here's the final um, general view. Um, we, we were fighting a bit with the idea that the piece was gonna last for five days. And that's why we, we were like really insisting on the bricks not having any cement, any mass to, to glue them to one another so that mainly all of them could be um, demounted and reused, um, which actually happened. I think like 95% uh, didn't break or anything and could be, and they were donated to citizens and to, um, construction um, brands that use them, construction companies. Uh, here you see the power of the of Monio's architecture and how we try to gently uh, dialogue with it. 
here are some more abstract photos with, with little people, with few people, sorry. Um, of course, the huge light con con contrast of, throughout the day. These are the, the, the narrow benches I was referring in the beginning, the ones that exist and that we were trying to equal in, in height. Circles were 20 meters, 30 meters, and 40 meters diameter. And we envision one activity to happen in, in each of them throughout the festival. But everything that we had planned could, uh, could happen because of budget, but other spontaneous things um, happen. And well, apart from these like uh, beautiful photos, these are our favorite pictures because they really show uh, people using the, the benches sitting there. And of course there were, I mean, mostly children were jumping on top and, 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 and playing inside. And old people were like always facing the exterior part of the circle because they wouldn't um, feel comfortable of stepping in. We had like, I don't know, 30, over 80 years, people talking to us about the, the installation. So it was actually interesting to see their thoughts. I think we finally managed to convince all of them that they could use it and it was fine that their taxes were being <laughs> used to this. Okay, and I think we're more or less have another 15 minutes. So this is the second project I'm gonna talk about quite briefly. This is a project to which um, two another Mexican architects, Chip and, Car and Carlos from To, uh, invited us to with uh, a sculpture and architect, um, Alberto Deriz. Um, and it's a pavilion um, that was to be done on a park with a pond, and we thought it would be very beautiful to work on the water in a way referring to <clears throat> Mexico City original um, condition, which it was a, a city founded on a system of lakes. And today many of those lakes are dry and actually the city is sinking because we're pumping out hundreds of liters of water a year from, from underneath. And that's why the, the land is sinking and uh, have huge um, urban problems. But the original uh, city had a, a, a much bigger harmony between land and water. So again, we, we carefully thought of which material we could use. This in the context of the 2017 earthquake that hit uh, Mexico City really strongly. And also many cities and villages around Mexico City, I mean, in Puebla, Oaxaca, very strongly. So there is this uh, little uh, city called Aquilan, which lost many of its uh, public um, buildings. And we wanted to, to take advantage of the budget to do this pavilion, to then donate something to Aquilan. So we thought about using earth uh, using a local material, uh, we we used um, earth mixed with a ten percent of cement to be able to compress these earth blocks with a machine. The machine needs to 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 drill two holes on each block. They're quite big. They're, they're six, sixty by thirty by twenty centimeters, so they are quite uh, heavy and 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 massive, and these blocks were afterwards donated to, to Aquila. Um, they finally weren't used for, for, for what we had thought, but they, they were used um, somewhere else in the city. So, well, it was important for us to, 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 to propose this uh, walkway, almost at the same level with the water, and then uh, we, we build this uh, U-shaped space uh, okay. Um, here you see some of um, 
Alessandro's uh, hand drawings and then um, that he transformed into technical drawings. But, but many of the, the drawings for small scale projects in, in, in Lanza, mainly for uh, furniture or industrial design are only hand drawings. So just for you to, to believe that it is possible to, to draw a project by hand yet uh, still in our days and have it built. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, here you see the the, the proportion that the, again the the sling nets that the length of the project and how it, it's experience in which you walk through the through the walkway and then you arrive to a place in which something is uh, awaiting you. Where it, what was interesting for me was that despite the, the, how big, how massive the walls are, um, sorry, I said uh, 60, it was, it's 30 and 30. So despite the walls were 60 centimeters uh, wide, they were permeable too, because through the holes, uh, when the bricks, when the blocks are positioned in the other way, you can see through it. So I thought it was beautiful, this um, duality in between uh, something, again, really uh, weighty, really, really massive, really bulky, but yet permeable. And there was something interesting happened that when you enter this opener U shape, the, the sound became very different because the, the the mass of the of the walls was absorbing a uh, lot of lots of the sound of the, from the city, so you had different acoustics um, inside. And this is the stone that Alberto possession uh, inside the the, the pavilion. I want to. We still have some minutes. I want to quickly ask the students. If somebody can guess how the how the um, the stone is floating there, and actually it wasn't only floating, but it was also um, moving. I don't know. Maybe if we have time at the end, I can show some videos of of how this stone was slowly moving up and down. So does anybody have a hint how how it was floating there? People at head. I know the mics are not working amazingly, but <laughs> any ideas? Any ideas? There's a cable holding the stone from the top somewhere. <laughs> we thought about doing that in the beginning because there's a tree on top, but, but we didn't use a, a cable. Someone else? It's a fixed stone. It's a balloon. It's a fixed stone. Huh? It's a balloon. It's a fixed stone. <laughs> uh, it's not a balloon, but that's a good one. <laughs> it's very 70s. Um, but there's something about the materiality. This is a volcanic stone. So it, it is much more porous and, and, and lighter than, than it looks. So it is a stone, but it's lighter than a, I don't know, a normal stone. And it's also carved uh, from, from beneath. So you see it complete uh, fr from the front, but it's carved from beneath. So it is big, but half of its mass has been uh, taken out. And then a steel beam goes through the, through the wall, through the hole and, and, and gets inside the stone. And because it goes through the wall and it uh, still, um, it goes to the other part. Okay, so I'm gonna explain it here in the section where we actually remove the beam to play this trick, but there is this beam going to here. There's a counterweight here. 
So because of the breeze and even because the beam is trying to equilibrate itself to find some balance, that stone is always slowly moving. But we um, were really thankful to Alberto for this, uh, for this stone that made people um, stay in the space uh, for, for much longer than, than, than we thought. And it actually, I mean, it happened even to, to myself. You stay there for, for a long time and, and manage to perceive other things that, that, I, that you wouldn't have without this attraction rock. Okay, so I'm gonna head really quickly into the last project, um, which was an installation in, in, in Madrid, in the Casa de Mexico, which is the, the, the Mexican cultural center in, in Spain, which opened like three years ago. And what we thought it was uh, interesting in this context is like Spain has had cultural centers in, in Mexico and of course other Latin American countries for a long time. And it is a cultural, they are cultural institutions, but they are also political um, tools. And, and, and now Mexico is, is you know, opening this um, cultural, again, political uh, institution in, in the center of Madrid. And they ask us to do something on the facade. So what we thought it was important was somehow take the image of this Spanish, like really Spanish, really Madrileño building from the beginning of the 20th century, which is an eclectic building, and blur this image and, and, and like put a veil on top of this facade to, to, to make it more blurry and to, to bring uh, uh, Mexico's uh, image, understanding that uh, as, as, as a concept, as a, as a mask concept, which is very present in, in pre-Hispanic, uh, mainly in Aztec uh, culture and Aztec uh, poetry. Um, this idea of, of veil, of uh, mask, and of um, things not being sharp, not being black or white, but being blurry in life. So it, uh, it, it was difficult to photograph the project because again, we only use one material, which is this uh, steel ball chain. And it, it was almost transparent. Uh, sometimes you could see it a lot because of light and reflections of movement and other times it disappeared. Um, it was nice that from inside the building, there was this communication with outside because maybe people inside through the windows could see the movement and they could know that someone was passing by and touching the, the, the ball facade. So you can see here uh, that, that this, this, the actual size of the material was uh, really small. And here, um, because we, uh, because I think it's uh, important, I'm gonna show uh, maybe a couple of very short videos so that you can see the, the movement and quickly head into Philippi's work. Okay, I'm gonna open this. Share screen again. Let's see if it works. I really like this one because there's a little girl with a bike moving the, moving the chain. And of course, I mean, children were, or even adults, were grabbing and breaking it. But again, um, we thought it, it was um, important to, to have this uh, interaction with the people. Let me just show maybe a last one. Um, there are many, so maybe this one. So here you can see that it was almost transparent. It was almost invisible, yet it was a hundred thousand meters of um, of ball chain. 
Well, so this is it. And the floating one? Sorry? Floating stone? Sorry, Anna. The video of the floating stone? Ah, yeah. Let me let me look for that. So let me go to Chivo Parque Lincoln, which is the name of the Lincoln. Yeah, so if you look into Alberto Derit's work, he works a lot with stones and with, with this idea of miraculously lift, lift a stone. Okay, photos. I'm not finding it right now. Let maybe let's head into Felipe's work and I will show it at the end of his talk. Just to look for it carefully. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much, Isabel. I knew I knew your your work uh, from images from Instagram. And so it's very nice to see it um, developed this way and uh, understanding the thing of the stone and the materials. Super nice to, to meet you this way. And uh, thank you also, Anna, for the invitation. I'll try to, to do it uh, very fast as well. So it will be, so I was checking your work as I was checking the lecture. And uh, mostly I'll try to not to go specifically too much into one project, but just to give you a general idea of the daily life of the office. And probably it will be confusing, but uh, it will leave you with some uh, tools maybe. If I, yeah. And to, to talk to you about something that has been uh, very interesting to us to explore, which is this idea of things being incomplete and uh, the, the image of the ruin as a project, mostly because our work is 90% uh, of the time uh, related to a ruin or to an existing structure. So we started visiting these, uh, these elements very often. And uh, in a way they started to, to become what the office is. And um, this image, for example, is probably the origin of the name of the office and this idea of assembling a body, uh, architectural body through different existing uh, elements that then if according to our idea, we would push and we would turn and we would create some kind of uh, structure. And this was the theory or the, the basis to start the office. So before there was even a project, there was this long period of thinking about architecture and thinking about what it means to the discipline itself and to, to produce architecture. And uh, we came to this uh, notion of architecture as the combination of two completely opposite uh, knowledges. So there is the, the arche, which uh, relates to a, a humanistic knowledge. So whatever is conceptual or something that can, cannot be measured or, or it's not physical. So it relates to the world of ideas. And uh, on the other side, text, texture, texture, which means uh, comes from techne which is completely the opposite. So it has a scientific and technological knowledge. So everything that you can measure and that you can, uh, in a way, uh, see and touch and uh, 
interact with directly. And these things, these technical aspect of architecture has to do with the, its body parts, that is uh, the floor, the walls, all of these elements that throughout history have never changed or uh, there were never new elements from, from the past hundreds and hundreds of years probably. And uh, most likely there will not be any new elements in the future. But as the opposite of this would be the, what we call the transformative actions. So things that we can do to these elements so that they convey some kind of idea that we're trying to, to transmit. And these are on the opposite end infinite because we can do anything to these elements and transform them in so many ways so that they present some kind of um, idea. So roughly it will look like a conceptual thought goes through these lines and interacts with concrete reality and transformative actions interact with the architectural elements. And in the middle of this, probably we can find some kind of architecture. And the way to find it for us is very much based on the drawings and the models, mostly drawings because they are easier and they don't mess, mess up the office so much, but also a little sometimes. But uh, also the, out the drawings that we started doing had these collages with the photos of the site or photos of material or elements that we want to use together with our uh, hands, handmade uh, symbols and uh, marks that we put on top of these things. So in the end, the drawing has kind of, it's kind of like architecture because it has something concrete, something based on reality and something based on conceptual thought. And as you start having more projects and combining all these things, you start to have these uh, existing things in your office that occupy space that you cannot sometimes uh, put, a, put in a drawer or something. You have to live with them every day and they start to be a lot of them and you live with them every day because you see ideas from three or four years ago still on a wall or and you pass by, by it every day and influences new ideas and new things that you are doing. So it starts to be like a, a self-regulating machine that you don't have to so much to come up with new ideas. You just have to look at what you did before and you will, as a new person by now, you will have new ideas on what you did before. And this is kind of uh, this cohabitation between us uh, references from books and our own drawings. And uh, how this translates into projects. And the first project we did, uh, feels like many years ago, was my grandparents' house, which was kind of a test project that where I thought if, if this works out, maybe we will have an office. If not, maybe I'll keep my day job. And uh, I really wanted to, to think about how to intervene in my grandparents' house, which was very special. And what we had to do from the beginning was to have a new roof. And uh, this actually reminded me of the, one of the presentations we saw this morning from a student, uh, the roof. In this case, I had no idea what to do with the project, but I knew that I had to do to have a wood structure roof. And because the builders, the local builders could not make concrete, so we had to do it in wood. And I, I didn't know how to make wood structure, so I just studied it. And uh, it came up with this idea of having this structure on top of the box and then probably expanding that structure until the ground and then expanding it to, to the sides so it would create this kind of skeleton inside the box. And that would be the, the project itself. So the, the answer came from 
me not knowing how to do a structure like this, the builder not knowing how to do it any differently. And in the end, it, uh, it looked something like uh, showing these bones inside the box, which was very curious because on the outside, we didn't do anything. It just remained a very silent rural house. And not, uh, not much later, I got another project close to, to that area with a very close, similar house. But uh, at the time I was thinking, I didn't want to repeat the wood thing because by now I know how to do a wood structure roof. So I went to play with this idea of structures and perhaps they don't have to be all in wood. I can bring some kind of stone from the outside because there were many. Maybe I can have a steel beam just to, to finish the structure. And uh, we were very in the beginning of the office, so we thought this was amazing. And we had no idea that maybe clients don't like this, but we were very lucky. And the client uh, enjoyed it a lot. He was very anxious about getting the stone. And so we had many trips to get the stone. And we finally did. And uh, this structure that we thought would be such a nice sculpture inside the box. So it, and in the end, it, uh, was built not as we expected because because uh, because of COVID the client had to drop the project but in the end we were able to make this sculpture inside the, these walls and uh, it's still now uh, there so it's we were very happy that this was the only project that stopped during COVID and it looks more or less as we expected. But in a certain way, we continue to, to want to have stones in buildings. And we thought if this worked with that client, we should try to, to make it work with other clients in other locations so that it would be a different kind of stone in a different geographical point. And we tried to convince one client in, in the south of Portugal that this was good. He thought it would look very nice, but he didn't go through the project yet. But we then lost hope. And this idea of creating kind of sculptures with the structural elements remained with us. And we just varied it from the stone became very difficult in some projects. So we started to have uh, like urban elements, like these doors that are very typical from, from the south of Portugal that we see. In, everywhere here in the city. So we started repeating these elements also in the, in the facades. And we went back to stones again, but uh, this time the client wanted us to make a, an apartment building with as much glass as possible and very modular so that he would make one floor and the second floor would be the same. So it would be easier for him to construct. And uh, we did exactly that, but we decided to put some stones. And we tried to tell them that these stones were very poetic, that had to do something with the, the landscape. And everybody would want to buy this, these apartments because of the stones, not the opposite. And he kind of believed it. So we are still trying to see what, what will happen with this one. He only asked us, how much does it cost these stones? And we said, Maybe because we did the model, we said maybe we can do the stones ourselves so we don't have to transport them. And he wanted to see a test of that. So we made a hole in the ground and we put some concrete. And in the end, we were able to find some, some stones. And um, another aspect of this idea of incompletion that we like so much has probably from the main reference that the office has um, is Garden Mata Clark. And this uh, action of cutting buildings and showing things that were previously hidden or showing spaces that were previously not connected. We started doing that in the one project that then also didn't went through, 
but it was a big uh, medium palace that we thought we could cut the ceilings and see the structure behind and then treat the, the existing structure. The client also thought it was a very good idea, but for some reason it didn't went through. And so I decided to do it in my house, which didn't have a uh, decorated ceiling, but in, in it's a very, very small house, so it's not a palace. But I thought it could be more or less like a palace if I, have, if I make a fake uh, ornamented ceiling and then not cut it because it was never complete, but to fake some kind of cuts and to show the existing structure. And so it was basically using that idea from the palace to my house, which I thought was very fancy. But then I didn't knew exactly what to do in the first floor because it had a different kind of ceiling and by accident, more or less, in uh, modeling in 3D, we made a circle and subtract and it made this shape that was unexpected. I thought it looked very nice, it looked better than the other one. And we also have used it more or less in other projects. And we started cutting facades as well. So this was a very interesting project because it's in a city center, but there was nothing there. And uh, the, the neighbor buildings were kind of very traditional or very ugly apartment buildings from the eighties. And both of these things coexisted in the same street. And we thought, let's make a, like a fake building again and cut it. So like fake cutting it as, as well, because the, the owner wanted to make apartments to sell. And we thought this had some, had some kind of charm and people would like it. And uh, the building itself started to create a lot of uh, feedback in the city, actually. And a lot of people hate it because they think uh, most of the people don't understand that it's a new building. They think it existed it before. Uh, and a lot of action on Facebook groups that are defending the city with uh, very interesting comments. So it, in a way, it's, it made people from the city start to talk about architecture and start to, talking about how the city looks and how we should approach it. And we are very proud of it. Only this cut in the main window in the facade, the municipality did not allow allowed us to do. So, but they told us we could do anything we wanted on the, on the back facade, and that's what we did. And because we thought this, and inside we kind of fake like the cuts that we made from the facade, we put inside and make the the divisions from social areas to private areas. And currently we are working on a facade for the same street, like two buildings uh, aside. And because the first one was green, we thought the second one should be red, which is kind of the same idea, but instead of cutting, we just put some parts and rotate facades of buildings together and assemble everything more or less like this. So in the same street, in the same facade of the street, we will have a green building and a red building and then a yellow building in the middle that uh, for some reason the client asked us to design and uh, we just did some, something very clean so that we didn't mess up the street too much so that the other two could, could shine. And uh, in the middle one, we just did something very simple. And uh, this idea of incompletion and things being, in our opinion, much more interesting once they are incomplete, came probably from the first project that we did in the city center, which was inside the, the castle that you have to go through that these arches that have such an interesting texture and mixture of white and stone. And then to go inside the house, you have to go through the walls of the castle and then through the walls of the facades. And our job very much was to design the walls inside of these walls. And um, we, from the beginning, very, 
enjoyed this kind of design of something incomplete. And so we proposed to remove, not to remove everything and then put something new inside, but just to remove some walls and then to cut the others in some kind of uh, irregular way. And uh, the marks of the walls that we removed are uh, remain in, on the ground so that looking at this image, we know how the house was before the divisions and we can see how it is now. And uh, this again was an idea that we kind of repeated in other ways in the different projects. And this, for example, was a, a builder that was showing, showing us some of his ongoing works. And we went and we saw this door. We thought this looks very nice. We should use something like this. And basically, we started thinking about this idea of having the door frames, but not having the walls would be kind of interesting. And so we mixed this with the previous project where you have, again, the marks of the previous walls on the floor. But uh, in th this time, we also kept the, the door frames. And so it, although it is an open space, you can see, you can start to have a division of the spaces according to uh, a function that you that the client would uh, give to the space. And in the facades of this project, the client asked us something about steel and stones, but we wanted to use concrete. So we designed a facade that starts from concrete and then dissolves into stones and uh, steel. And then by the end, we do the traditional design of the house that was in the main facade but we do it uh, more or less transparent. And again, this is, was, is one of the projects as well that the people from the city are very angry in, on Facebook because they think it's the main facade that they will have to see this from the street, but that, that's not true. This is in the, in the back facade. So it has three buildings and they are all very hidden and nobody will, will ever see them. And uh, another, not very far away from this, another project that we, it's very recent, but uh, for some time we wanted to work with mirrors and have something uh, with this, but never, we were made some tries, but we were never very happy with them. But this time we had a very similar building again, and we used a more or less similar strategy, but because it was smaller, the client didn't want the, the existing door frame, so we just had some so that you can see that it's there. And the engineers asked us to, to introduce structure to, to the project. Steel structure would be the, the cheapest way. And uh, we convinced the client that this structure that is the most functional one, although it's probably not. We designed it ourselves. And we thought that by putting a mirror and at the end of the, each beam or at the end of each column, then it creates this illusion of being an infinite beam that the, there's another space behind the kitchen. And again, we said to the client that this would be very good to promote the apartments and to sell them very quickly. And he also believed that that will be the case. And uh, we are moving forward with this one, I think. And uh, on a different way to approach this idea of incompletion was my previous apartment, which was this empty box. So it was a studio apartment with a kitchenette and a bathroom, nothing else, just open box to, to introduce anything. And we thought a lot about how to make architecture from this because we weren't making walls or opening windows or making anything new. The only thing we could do was to design uh, furniture and then to place it inside this, this box. And we wanted to do it kind of like a, a ruin of a, a classical ruin so that you would have a column. Have a, the, the podium and these elements together. 
and transform them into uh, furniture. So basically that's what we did. And then we painted them yellow, although the yellow was much stronger than I anticipated. But in, in the end, it kind of looks like a, a room, classical ruin. But at the same time, one can say that it looks like a sculpture inside the gallery that you can walk through and you can understand space through movement and through uh, your relationship between your movement and the position of these elements. And we were very happy with that, I, that we understood that by, by making furniture. And we kept on more or less doing that this time again with uh, these doors from the facade that we bring or the windows from the facade that we bring the same design to the interior so that they could mark transitions from uh, kind of a entrance space that the client requested that doesn't really exist but in a way the door creates a transition between the main door and the living room and a different project which kind of has the whole of these ideas combined as well and also to do it on on the facade which uh, it's actually not so much our idea but it's just some buildings that we find that were painted white and then the some elements become incomplete and we just use that to to make a kind of a dyslexic facade. And to, to do it also in the facade, but with ornaments so that the, the building is, in this case, it's a white, small, traditional house that we paint everything white. And then we just put some stone so that the house seems a bit richer than it actually is. This one was also very difficult to convince the municipality and uh, all the entities that need to be convinced to do this. And uh, kind of the same idea, but on a different uh, project that mixes, again, different ideas together. And they, they always kind of look the same, but at the same time, they always look very different from each other. And uh, this is it. Thank you very much. I don't know if the, um, there are questions from the audience. If we can see the floating stone, if it showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I just messaged um, um, Alberto. So if he could share more info on floating stones. And also because, let me open the one. I'm not finding the floating stone video, but I'm gonna show a video that a friend did with his um, drone that he had just purchased. So it's not a great video, but you'll see the, the trick. You, we won't see the, the magic of the floating stone, but you'll see the, the beam I was planning and the, the, counter, the counterfeit. Hopefully, Alberto will send some video sometime soon. But because of the, the size of the beam, um, the movement at the extreme was really, really uh, slight, which we cannot perceive here, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you anyway. And thank you both for well, both presentations. I, Very different I, ones. I got this, okay. this message from this photo from a friend that was in labor yesterday that uh, sent a photo of her baby and I start crying. <laughs> I hope you didn't worry. So, um, questions from the audience? I hope uh, I have a question, maybe. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. 
a look here. The microphone is there. Um, I think if there is one topic that seems to be existing in both your practices and, and in very radically different ways, it's perhaps, I would say, very different relationships to construction. And because in a way, I, my understanding is that in the project by Lanza that we've seen today, it's almost as if construction wants to disappear almost maybe to the moment, to, to the extent where it becomes almost a research for a miracle, as you said, and this disappearance of it. While in Corpo's case, it seems like the first projects are very much starting from ideas of construction. And in the end, construction becomes something that seems to become more and more sophisticated and, and complex. And, and so I wonder simply what, if you think that in your practice, the image comes before the constructive idea or, or vice versa, what leads the other ones? Or what is, it, what is the, dynamic, the dynamic between these two? Um, I was actually reflecting about how in um, Corpo Atelier work, um, architecture seems to um, originate from either subtraction or, or addition of elements. And how in, in uh, the projects I brought today, um, architecture seems to originate from, from an idea of unity. Or, I mean, we never allow parts to talk by themselves or to have their own personality. Architecture seems as a as, 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 um, global, uh, uh, enclosed um, uh, thing. And I might not have the answer, but I somehow see uh, an answer or, or a dialogue with um, the territory and um, how in, 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 in Europe, in Portugal, or in, in Mexico, um, the, the, the landscape and geography are built in, in these different ways. So as, as much as I know what this uh, Spanish case, it's like reality is a sum of parts, of actors, of efforts. Uh, it, it's a collective effort in which you can identify each uh, actor. And in Mexico, you never you never get to see the parts. You never get to see the different voices. You you only um, you only see a a, 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 a communal uh, result, but you there's no author behind it. And maybe uh, there's a link in between um, those things. For us, I think it has a lot to do with image because we have, I think, five, six years of office. So in the beginning, we didn't know anything about construction or how things are made. We just we are just making images, really. And then someone will tell us how to build it and how to solve the problem. And in a way, it's still like that. We are now we know a bit more about construction, not that much. So we work very much with, with the image and having something very clear from the beginning. Uh, that's, that's why the, the drawings to have them on the wall so that you know each, most of these projects, I don't know how the bathrooms are and I don't know the light switches and I don't know yet a lot of things, but I know exactly the idea and I know which way to go. And to most of them, I don't know some how to build some details that we have. So for example, the grid, metal grid with the stones inside that has been like a challenge for, from the past months that we are trying and seeing and asking the builder to make some tests. But uh, it's very much to have an idea, a very clear idea, a very clear image from the beginning. And then you start solving all of those problems. Uh, maybe, in 10 or 20 years, I don't know, we will be very uh, knowledgeable in building. And so we will start to make ideas from uh, building techniques, but uh, not yet. 
But that's so interesting, Philippe, because I believe that in Mexico, because we know that we won't have true control of things, mm -hmm. when we cannot aim for, I mean, I'm generalizing, like trying to, 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 to find a concept that we cannot aim for um, construction control, truly. So it's like we get rid of that um, aim from the beginning and we, and we say, okay, let's, let's count on what we can deliver and control, which is just a concept because we won't be able to, to truly uh, uh, control the 100%. And I think um, it's beautiful how both, uh, uh, both things like what you're explaining and, 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 and the situation uh, here, um, or maybe our, our, how we have learned to uh, position ourselves, how both things uh, um, are interlinked. And I think to us, this idea of incompletion, although it's in a way a very personal thing that I happen to very much enjoy it, I think something very symmetrical or repetition of elements becomes kind of boring because if you see one, it's exactly the same in the end. So I like, I enjoy the, the aesthetic experience of it, but mostly it's the most important thing that we've learned in the office is don't try to make everything symmetrical and aligned and perfect ge geometrically because in the, the building it will not work out. So just put things that are not aligned. It doesn't matter if the client then wants to move a window or wants to move a wall. The idea is still there and it's very changeable. So, and our plans are very straightforward, very functional. And if the client then wants to move this to this side, it just works anyway. So those ornaments, for example, in the last project, we place them like that. But if the builder doesn't doesn't know how to read the drawing and then makes some kind of mistake, it works anyway. So it was the most useful thing that we've learned in the office <laughs> so far. I'm glad to know we are not the only ones who don't know how to build. <laughs> and I'm also glad to know that we're not the only ones that operate in a context where we don't control in full the construction. So maybe you're not that different in the end. You know, I, 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 don't have, I don't know if what I have to ask is a question or if it is more a provocation or a, I don't know, but let's try. One of the things, and, and making a parallel to what we saw in the morning in the student projects, uh, one of the things that I think students could extract from these two presentations, regardless of the differences in image of the projects, because that's not at all the topic here, is the motivation. And I'm going to argue, for example, when Lanza draws a table that has the chairs fitting on the frame and, you know, there's, there's a, a finesse and an ambition that fits, in my opinion, the way how Corpo reproduces, for example, the tiniest detail in stone on a facade mm -hmm. that is bigger than the motivations that most of the times are non-existent that big star architects imply when they design museums. So I think that the quality of the ambition, if you can measure the quality of an ambition, is much bigger in smaller, younger practices like ours, you know, like practices that are like yours, that are you know, starting that many times we, we do not have museums and schools to design. So we need to operate on a very low scale of commissions, but I think it's possible to do better architecture or more relevant architecture in this small scale than most big architects do in the bigger scale because they don't care anymore. Do you agree with this? Do you think that there's a, and, and the same thing, I mean, I, I would put this on the student side, like, like they are doing small interventions, but because they are small, doesn't mean they need to be small, if you know what I mean, so. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that you're referring, um, Philippe, to, to this kind of uh, projects, more in the <clears throat> scale of industrial design, which we still um, count on and believe um, it's architecture, but because, uh, on that on that scale, we do have 
almost full control because we produce it with our people. Maybe in that scale, we're closer to a uh, corp atelier, atelier corpo um, um, uh, work because um, we know that we can pay attention to, 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 to construction details. And, and maybe as I explained in the beginning that um, coming from uh, ephemeral projects in the very first two years of our career, uh, we try to, to, to strike the, the radicality of that works and, and, and take it to permanent architecture. Um, I believe that somehow that our experience with um, really small scale architecture uh, as a dining set, as a table, um, is something we're, we're trying to extrapolate it more and more to bigger uh, scale architecture. Um, and when you mention this, this kind of, uh, of, of sets in, we, in which we're talking about pieces, dialoguing and, 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 and like embracing, like kissing one another and, 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 and becoming uh, something complete only when they encounter. Um, I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's a very architectonic um, um, desire behind that. And we have only managed to produce it uh, at a table scale, but we're working on it. <laughs> I think the, the biggest difference probably has to do with the authority measure that you can have on a project. So we don't have almost any authority over, over the project. We have the builders talking to the clients and saying, hey, why, why don't you put a cheaper material? It's easier, it's better, don't listen to these architects. And uh, you have uh, the builder that says, I'm paying for my house, I do whatever I want, it's my house. So we are very small in these big ambitions, come with a lot of, and you know that, with a lot of fights and with a lot of um, frustration every, every day. So that's, what I, I don't know, but I don't think star architects or big companies uh, operate that way because in a way they have some kind of a authority or a hold on the project that they can say, no, this is the way I want to do it and I'm, I'm in charge here. And we, are, we started with 27 years making projects. Nobody will listen to us. So we have to be very creative, not only in the project, but how to convince everyone around that this actually will look very nice. And I think that we can do a project in one afternoon sometimes, but we to convince people, it takes like uh, months of caring, of calling. Do you remember that idea? It looked very nice. Please don't forget once we are doing the building. And this happens uh, like every day, I think. If, if this small scale architecture has value, it's not only because of the project, but it's because of the effort that uh, we have to do so we can just have it built and so that people will enjoy. Well, I heard some stories about Caesar wanting to quit on some projects because some younger architect in the municipality said it was not good enough to see them. So uh, maybe it's not just for young people. The, it's fine. Well, we are running out of time. We will have to move forward. This is, say, say. Uh, I was going to say it makes me feel a bit better. Yeah. But I, yeah, at the same time, I think it's the worst thing our generation can do is to compare itself to uh, the previous one. But I think, yeah, we join again in in 15 minutes for the yeah. okay let's make a minutes. break of 10 minutes yes. in 10 minutes at, uh, yeah in 10 minutes at, at the round hour well, um, thank you very much thank you for the much. talks they were very interesting i hope the students enjoyed we cannot see faces which is a bit sad but we hope they enjoyed